Good afternoon. We're going to start on our uh, new chapter, chapter 7, which is an introduction to the second law. This is, this, this is the chapter which starts introducing the concept of entropy. I've been talking about entropy, I've been referring to S um, in a steam table in some of the previous uh, examples, and we never sort of really went inside and, you know, we re never discussed the details. We still have one more chapter, which is the last chapter, which really just focuses on entropy. Uh, but before introducing entropy, we have to start introducing something called the heat engines. And this chapter is really about the heat engines. Now, like, as always, when we want to introduce a new concept, we have to build up some background and some theoretical stuff. And normally that is in the form of revising some physics, because physics really is the basis of a lot of uh, thermodynamic concepts and some of the thermodynamic uh, laws as well. So we, s we have to really start from, from that point. Now, something which we've been looking at, I mean, just a quick overview of what, what we've covered so far. We started with the zeroth law. And we know that that was about temperature. Zeroth law led to some important definitions, but it was about temperature. That was a fundamental part of the zeroth law. When it, come, when it came to the first law, then we had the equation of W and Q and, and internal uh, energy, but really it was about U, and U, which is the intrinsic internal energy, it was about really the quantity of energy. It was really the measure of you know, higher quantity of energy, lower, and of course it's quite straightforward because if you have higher U, you have higher amounts of energy to, to do any work, whether it's, it's heat or actual work itself. Now, the second law really, which is about entropy, S, is about the quality of energy. Now, I have mentioned that a lot of people may struggle with the concept, with grasping the concept of entropy, and I think the reason is because it's less physical. Hopefully when I explain, it might, it hopefully makes more sense, but when, it, when you're talking about quantity, it's clear. If I have two apples here and one apple here, obviously, you know, we've got more. You talk about quantities, you can count them, you can, you can, you can visually see them. When it comes to quality, um, it's not that straightforward, and that comes to uh, that has actually that applies to a lot of different uh, concepts as well. But it's equally important because sometimes we haven't thought about the quality of energy, but the fact that you have certain amounts of energy in one system and certain amounts of energy in, in another system may not necessarily mean the same thing because you're not looking at the quality of, of that energy, and that, that's what we're re really looking at in in this chapter and the next chapter. Now, there has been a lot of attempts in terms of defining what entropy is, uh, and I'm going to try to look at those now and also in, in conjunction with, this, with, the, with the next chapter. But some of the terms which have been used are, for example, here. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to write here. So entropy, it has some elements or some definitions of disorder. And actually, this is my favorite one. This is the one that I, I normally associate with. Uh, I can understand entropy in, in the concept of, of disorder. And we'll see it in a moment. Spontaneous and reversibility. The reversibility is the fact is the, uh, the aspect which is going to be addressed in, in the last chapter. We're going to be looking at the reversal processes. We're going to make some introduction in this chapter as well, but it really the next chapter is the one that looks at reversibility. In your text, we're going to start with, with the first equation. Um, 
these are the three terms which I introduced here. And just to give you an idea of what the first page really contains, um, I think this bit really talks about zoom out a bit. This bit really talks about the disorder. This is the part about the spontaneous. And this part is about the part which talks about the reversibility. Now, starting with the disorder, which I think probably is, is the most relevant one, we come across an equation. This is the part which I said, you know, we looked at physics. This, as you know, thermodynamics, if you, for example, go to the School of Physics, if you were studying uh, physics in your, as your first degree, you would be taking a module called thermodynamics as well. So thermodynamics actually is not only engineering, it has roots in physics, uh, but the sort of things that we look at are, are more engineering aspects that we focus on. Uh, but for example, this, the, the way that uh, physicists would look at entropy would be through something, uh, a simple equation like this. This is just basic. Um, and you've got entropy here. You've got K, which we've seen before as well. When we were talking about Avogadro's uh, um, hypothesis, it's a Boltzmann constant and has a very small value, as you remember, in the order of 10 to the minus 23. But we have a new parameter here, which is W. And this W <coughs> excuse me, is, is a number of ways that molecules and particles in a system can arrange themselves. What does it mean? Well, if you think about, I'm going to come back to this example of of this class, and if you think of yourselves as uh, particles in this in this room, and as and, and think about this room as a system, the orders or the arrangement that you guys will sit in this room would vary every every time, every day, every time that you come to this room, you will take a different seat. So, well, some of you stay, stay in the same seat, but that's not the point. And this arrangement, imagine for this very small, we're talking about 200, 300 people in this course. If you're talking about billions and billions and billions of particles, the number of arrangements that they can actually arrange themselves, again, would be in the order of 10 to the you know, power 23, 25, 26, etc. It's going to be a massive, massive number. And that is your W in this case. Now, we can discuss this equation a lot, but I'm, I'm just going to give you one example. We have a situation called absolute zero. You may have heard about absolute zero, which is at minus 273 Celsius. That's the lowest temperature that could exist. At that temperature, it's just too low that no particle can actually have any movement. So everything is actually frozen, literally. You know, you, there's not going to be any activity, there's not going to be any movement at the microscopic level, which means that arrangement which I talked about, which could have billions of, of possibilities, in that situation you have only one possibility because, because there's no movement of particles, you have only one set of arrangements, right? In that case, W will be equal to 1. And ln of 1 is 0. So in that situation, because w is going to be equal to 1 and ln 1 equal is equal to 0, entropy is going to be equal to 0 as well. Which suggests that in that state, entropy has its lowest value. It can't be less than that. You can't have negative entropy. That's the lowest entropy. So what's the implication of that? If that state gives you the lowest entropy, what does that state tell you about the level of disorder? Now, actually, the disorder is very much zero because you don't have a lot of chaotic movements, right? So there's, there's no, you know, when, when, there's, 
when you have a, uh, you know, when you have activity of molecules and atoms and they're, they're working together and, uh, and you know, they're interacting with each other, then surely you have a large disorder. But when you have only one arrangement, everything is in one place, everything is very neat, there's no movement, there's no change, therefore you have the lowest level of disorder. And this sort of introduces the fact that entropy and disorder are synonym, or they're sort of re they're relevant to each other. In other words, if I want to think about the definition of, of S, I could sort of say that S is, is indirectly proportional to quality, first of all, which I'm going to come back to this, and it's also indirectly proportional to the order which means it's proportional to disorder. So whenever, whenever disorder is high, entropy is high. Whenever disorder is low, entropy is low. And it's the same about the quality. When you have high entropy, the quality is low, and vice versa. Now, that's about the disorder. Um, I, I think it might be useful, actually, before, if I, if I, before I go to, to spontaneous and reversibility, I'd like to think about one very much practical example on the disorder, because I want to make sure that you grasp this, this concept and this relevance of, of disorder here. If I, you know, when you, for example, toss a, a coin, it could be a tail or it could be a head, right? And you've, you might have studied uh, probabilities and possibilities and calculating the, the number of scenarios that you could end up. Um, if you have four coins, the possibility of getting all of them with tails or all heads is relatively rare, right? You don't get that very often. If you get, for example, however, looking at another possibility, having two tails and two heads, statistically, and not actually statistically, you can actually do a calculation on probability, this is six times more likely to get. Yeah, and we all agree on that. Let's now talk about the um, disorder and the likelihood and the entropy on in these two scenarios. Now, looking at the first case, everything is the same, all tails, if you have OCD, you would love it because it just means everything's stuck in the same order, same shape. Now, in terms of disorder, this is actually quite low. It doesn't have much sort of disorder because everything is quite organized. In terms of likelihood, it's actually low as well. You don't get that very often if you start tossing the coin. And in terms of entropy, this is actually quite low as well. Because of those concepts that we've introduced and what entropy really means in this context. And for this case, which is six times more likely to get, the level of disorder is actually higher because you've got two types um, and therefore you have higher disorder. The likelihood is actually going to be higher. As a result, entropy is going to be higher as well. And the fact that by nature, this is six times more likely to happen, this means that naturally, things will actually move towards higher entropy. We'll come back to this actually uh, in, in the last chapter. I want to talk about um, the whole level of entropy in the world and in the universe, which is, which is increasing as we speak. Uh, but that's a, sort of a different theory and hypo hypothesis. I don't, I don't want to get into that now. But let's now talk about, let's just move on. Hopefully this now makes sense. It makes sense what, you know, what is the relationship between entropy and disorder. Now, talking about spontaneous, something about this spontaneous is that if you have, we know that if you have a, um, uh, a system at high temperature 
And if you have a system at low temperature, and these are actually are brought in contact, you would have a flow of energy from, or heat, from the hot, hot source to the cold source. We know that. And that actually happens spontaneous. You don't have to have any mechanism or any tool to accelerate um, this, this process. It happens automatically. And it happens right away. As soon as you connect them, that equilibrium and transfer of energy happens. That is actually the fact that in, in, you know, in, our, um, in, in nature, because a lot of things actually are spontaneous and you don't have actually control over them, it's the same thing in thermodynamics. And it just suggests that entropy, again, in the universe will actually increase because of the nature of, because of the spontaneous nature of, of the world. So that, that spontaneous behavior would also result in an increase of entropy. This is what um, this paragraph is really talking about. The reversibility, I'm not going to really dwell much on, on this because it will come back to this and we'll see a lot of examples because a, rever a reversible process is a process which means that there's not going to be any change in entropy. And that is almost, well, actually, it's, it's impossible to, to get that. Why? Because if a process or a cycle needs to be reversible, it means that infinitesimal changes in the property of the system without dissipation of energy. And you, do, and you rarely get that, actually. You, don't, you can't have a process physically. You can't have a process which happens so slow that there's no dissipation of energy whatsoever. We've been looking at lots of examples like that. We've been saying that. Let's assume that everything is done at a very slow pace. And that was because we wanted to have a sort of a, 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 a very, a, a, an ideal scenario. But in, in reality, if you want to have a reversible process, that means that, that this process actually would take, the whole process has to be done while you have thermodynamic equilibrium. And that actually means that it would take an infinite amount of time for the process to, to be completed. And if you have, if your process takes an infinite amount of time, we know that actually this is not going to be feasible in reality. Therefore, a perfectly reversible process is really impossible, but we'll, we'll be actually using this concept and this um, assumption in a lot of scenarios because um, this allows us to, to define lots of different useful equations which will come handy later on. That reversibility in, in its simplest form will lead to one equation which, this is actually one of the basics of um, reversibility which we'll come back to this in the next chapter and we're going to do a lot of analysis on this type of equation. But really here, it talks about the fact that the change of entropy, by the way, we are we are more interested, in fact, all, always we are interested in the change of entropy, not in the absolute value of entropy. Similar to entropy, where we said the actual value of entropy is not really useful as such. It's normally about delta H, which is important. It's the same with the change of entropy, which is, which is meaningful. Uh, and in this case, you can relate the change of entropy in the reversible amount of heat added to the system divided by the temperature in this case. Okay, so that was a bit of definition on entropy and, and a bit of physics. Now that's the part which start, we want to start looking at the actual heat engine. Heat engines are, are actually quite, they, they, they are as engineering as, it, as they can get. Uh, they are the backbone of lots of different systems as we'll see hopefully in this lecture. And in fact, the relationship between the second law and um, thermodynamics comes from the heat engine. So the way that the, the, the thermodynamics actually introduces the second law is via heat engines. Now, I want to look at what really heat engines are. And there are some properties, really, or there are some definitions, which we'll come back to this again. Uh, but Heat engine 
is, a, is essentially a, a cycle. It could be a power plant cycle, it could be a refrigeration cycle, cycle, as we'll see after a few examples which I give. We'll actually study those cycles. It's also placed between two reservoirs. Um, one is a hot one, a hot reservoir, and the other one is a cold reservoir. Now, there are two assumptions related to the, uh, these, the, for example, the hot reservoir. The first one is that this has an infinite heat capacity. So compared to the heat engine itself, the reservoir has infinite amount or capacity for, for heat. The second assumption is that it can reject or absorb heat without change in temperature. So regardless of how much heat it absorbs or how much heat it rejects, the actual temperature of the reservoir doesn't change. If you, if you imagine, if you're looking at a at large sea or an, or an ocean, whatever you do, you know, whatever, I don't care how much or how big your heat source is, if you place that large heat source in the ocean, you can't really assume that the temperature of the ocean has increased because of that, because it's just massive, right? And this is the same concept. This is, the heat capacity is, is infinite, and it's not going to be really changed, and temperature is not going to really, really change by, by heat absorption or rejection. So these are the two assumptions about the reservoirs. There's also one uh, assumption about the actual heat engine itself. This has to be a continuous, continuously operating, continue, I hate this word, continuously operating cycle or system. And what I mean by cycle, it means that you can't have any mass leaving um, the, um, the heat engine. Otherwise, it's not going to be a cycle. And it's actually continuously operating. Before I, I actually introduce two real concepts, let me just leave that for a few more seconds. Before I introduce the, uh, the heat engines, I just want to talk about three examples which would demonstrate the importance or the relevance of the second law in thermodynamic systems. So let's move on to our ne next page, 7.3. On this page, I've got three rather simple examples. Example one, two, three. Ignore the figure numbers, which are not in order. Talking about disorder. Okay, so the first example, you've got a ship or a, or a vessel. This ship, you know, it's, it's a massive um, large ship in this example. Now, you can assume that the sea temperature, whatever that sea temperature is, you know, if you're talking about Mediterranean, maybe you're talking about, depending on the season, you're talking about 17, 18 uh, Celsius, for example. If you're talking about the ocean, it might be lower, whatever, you know, whatever the temperature is, it, might, it means that actually that the sea and the ocean would have, it must have actually gigajoules of energy because it's beyond, it's actually above, uh, zero temperature, zero Celsius, and we know that because it's beyond, it's, it's actually above this, uh, the zero temperature, uh, zero Celsius. It has, it have to have a lot of energy, and we know that you know this, the sea level um, and the sea itself would have gigajoules of energy at least. Now, why is it that we can't build a ship 
or, or an engine for the ship that would extract this heat and then be able to operate and convert that into shaft work and then you know turn the propeller and then move. Because if you invented that system, that invention would be groundbreaking, right? But you would never get that. You would never be able to extract that energy and convert it into something useful in terms of shaft work. Let's just use that as one example and then you know, find out exactly why that's the case. The second example is if you have a container and you have a propeller inside this container, now you start heating up this container. Maybe just put a candle or flame or something here. You start heating up this, can uh, this, this container. Temperature goes up. If there is gas already in this container, Obviously, the temperature of the container will go up, the temperature of the gas. Do you think at some point that the propeller would start turning? It, it won't, right? Because, I mean, depending on, regardless of how much you heat up this, um, this gas, unless there is some turbulence, there's some sort of phase change, or there's, a very, sort of, there's sort of a very complicated sort of um, physics going on in the container, the propeller, you can't have a continuous movement of the propeller simply by adding the heat to the container. In fact, the equation, if you look at the first law, this is the equation for this example. And why do we have to assume that Ws equals zero? Despite having a shaft there, there's not going to be any work out of, out of this work. That's one question, even though we know that the, the, the reverse of that actually is possible because if you start adding some work to the propeller and start rotating the propeller by an external force, we know that the temperature of the gas inside the container actually is going to go up. And we've seen that in, in lots of examples. But the reverse of that is not possible. And the third example, which is the most obvious one, is about the non-reversibility. And that's when, for example, you have a glass of water or drink, and then it, it drops uh, in a falls from, from the table. Initially, it has some, kinetic, some uh, potential energy because it's actually above the, uh, the level. Uh, is, it has gained already some potential energy. And it is that potential energy which will be converted into, um, for example, um, kinetic, acoustic, and thermal energy, right? In terms of noise, the sound it makes, in terms of breaking up the, the glass, and lots of things that happens during that process. If you could... So by, this, actually, this process satisfies the first law uh, and the conservation of energy. If you could somehow contain all this energy, which has been, um, you know, the energy which was converted, the, what I mean is if you could conserve the kinetic energy, the acoustic, and the thermal energy, still you won't be able to reverse this process. You, can't, you won't be able to put everything back together and for the glass to leap back on, on the table which is, just shows that the non-reversibility nature of, of how things work. And the point of giving you all these three examples is because the second law really starts answering these questions, these questions which the first law can't answer. So if you, if you didn't have the second law, you would be puzzled because the first law would be satisfied in lots of these, in lots of these, these examples, but still you're not going to get anywhere. So. If a process needs to be, uh, if a, a cycle or a, or a system um, has to be possible, it has to meet both the first law and the second law. So it has to tick both. If it doesn't, and if, you know, most importantly, so, so let's put it this way. If a process ha needs to be physical and practical, it has to meet both laws. In other cases, the sec what the second law does, it puts some limits on some and some caveats on the first law. So it has two roles. Either it has to be met, which means the process then is going to be possible, or it will put some limits on the first law to make it physical and make the process um, fit in physical in real world. And 
It does that by introducing the concept of, of, of entropy, as we'll see later on. These two figures here are very important to remember. This really is, these are the pictures that I want you to have in your mind when you think about the heat engines. This is something very similar to what I drew on, on, on the piece of paper about the heat engine uh, and the two reservoirs, as you can see there. Try to put the hot, when you want to redraw them, and sometimes you have to do it, always try to put the, the hot one on the top and the cold one in the bottom, as you'll see later on, because it makes it easier. But looking at the, some of the assumptions or some of the characteristics of the heat engine, these are the characteristics which, which I refer to them as well. So the heat engine receives heat from a high temperature reservoir, as you can see here. They convert part of this heat to work. As you can see, some work will, uh, will actually come out of the heat engine. In this case, is the WS, which is a shaft work. They reject the remaining or heat or waste heat to a, to a low temperature reservoir. As you can see, part of the heat which has not been used will be transferred to another reservoir, which in this case is the cold one. And the heat engine operates in a cycle. So we have two types, type one and type two. And this is a very broad category of, of heat engines. Let's just see if you can spot the difference. The first thing is the direction of the heat. In the first case, which is a direct heat engine, as the name suggests, the heat comes from the hot reservoir, it goes to the engine, it would lead to some uh, shaft work, and Q2, which is the waste heat, will go to the cold reservoir. In the reversed heat engine, we have the opposite. So some heat will be absorbed from the cold reservoir by the heat engine, and then that heat will be then go towards the hot reservoir. But because this process is not natural, it would have to provide some work to the heat engine. As you can see, the arrow of the W, S is actually in this direction now. That's the part which you have to provide some work to the engine. Something else about, so the description of these two are here. This is the direct engine, this is the reversed heat engine. The other terminology which will, not terminology, but notation that we're gonna introduce here is that the temperature which will be, um, which be, will be supplied to the heat engine from Q1 will be at T1, and the temperature at which Q2 is rejected will be T2, and the same will be here, T2, T1. So when we talk about temperature, make sure you, you understand and remember what these temperatures really mean. Now, this is the part which it gets really, really interesting. Now, you looked at the broad concept of heat engine. I'm now going to look at what this engine really is. This is one example of the heat engine in the form of the steam turbine power plant. And this is actually what, so I want you to, to imagine this, the whole thing, what you see here, is actually what would go inside this box in here. So this is where we are looking at the details of the heat engine. This is the example of the direct heat engine. If you like, this is called the ranking cycle. We'll do some analysis on the ranking cycle, especially in the second year and third year, but um, it's, it's one of the most famous thermodynamic cycles. It has four components. You might be familiar with some of these. This is the cycle that you would get in any power plant. Whether it's nuclear, whether it's uh, coal, natural gas, or whatever, this is the, the structure of how you would 
change or how you would convert the temperature or the heat from the core of the power plant, could be the nuclear, for example, the heat which comes from the, the uranium fuel, and then how you convert that into some useful work, it will be done through this um, cycle. So the direction of the cycle is in this direction. The four components that you've got here, you've got the turbine, you've got the um, essentially a, a heat exchanger, which in this case uh, acts as a condenser, you've got the feed pump, and you've got the boiler, which is another heat exchanger in this case. Now, the first thing I'll, I want to mention is that the heat engine itself would, would consist of all these four components. It can't be just, for example, the turbine because, you co well, the fact that the work W work turbine is actually coming out of the turbine, that doesn't mean that your heat engine is just this bit. Because mass is actually crossing the boundaries of, of this. And if this was your engine, we would be violating one of the uh, assumptions that we said that it's going to be a cycle and the mass is not going to um, flow through its boundaries. So it has to be the whole four components that you're looking at. I think it makes more sense if I start talking about um, or drawing um, the PV diagram for the cycle and then explaining how it works. So if you understand what's happening here, then it means you understand how any power plant would actually function. And then actually I will explain um, the, uh, what the hot reservoir and the cold reservoir actually represents. So PV diagram, we normally start with this um, so dashed line which represents the um, critical points and the uh, saturated lines, which we've been dealing with a lot. This is an ideal cycle, by the way. Uh, in reality, you have losses and other things which would change uh, these cycles. But for now, let's just look at this type of cycle. Each curve in here would represent what happens to the flow across one of these four devices or, or components. The first one, by the way, let's just remind you, remember when I was introducing the PV diagram, I said you have a number of constant lines, constant temperature lines, isotherms. It seems that lines like that and that our constant temperature as well, and we'll see uh, later on about this. But the actual, so what happens really in the cycle is that here, this is where we have the Q in, and this is actually where we have the, the turbine. So in, in the turbine uh, sort of phase, sorry, it's not the turbine, this, this is the um, uh, this is the turbine. When you're looking at PV or TS diagram, the, uh, the order of these components will change. That's why sometimes it gets quite confusing. So this is the pump. This is the turbine. And in this example, this is the boiler. And this is the condenser. The first thing you realize is that in the boiler and the condenser, because all it's changing is the phase change, and the temperature is not going to change, therefore you have these horizontal lines which would represent the isotherms which I mentioned in here, in this form. And of course, the, the pump and the turbine make sense because in the pump, what happens is that the pressure of the, of the working fluid will go up, that's why you have this change of, of pressure. And in the turbine, you would lose that pressure 
and the pressure actually reduces um, following uh, the turbine, and therefore that's the sort of the fourth uh, components of the cycle. And as far as the boiler is concerned, you have Q in, and in the condenser you have Q out. That's just to understand the, the function of these cycles. Let me quickly ask you a question. So, a, in a power plant, what do you think represents the hot reservoir? And what do you think represents the cold reservoir? Starting with the hot one, do you know what is the hot reservoir? Let's, let's say a, uh, a nuclear power plant in Cumbria, in the UK. Uh, what would be the, the, the hot reservoir? Exactly, that would be the, 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 the core of the reactor. That's actually where the temp, the, this is the, when I was talking about the, the hot reservoir and I said um, it has infinite amounts of, of heat capacity, it's because we assume that you're just going to get a, you know, huge amounts of heat coming out of the core of the reactor. Or if you're burning gas, natural gas or coal, that's the same thing. You're, you have huge amounts of heat coming out of that. And in the case of the cold reservoir, what, what about that? Can you think of that? Cooling tower is actually one of those components here. Cooling tower is actually that type of um, heat exchanger, part of the heat exchanger. It's not the cold reservoir. It's the water, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the pond, it's a lake, it's a sea, where you normally build your power plant next to it. And, that, I, and I think this explains it. Remember, in, in one of the very few, uh, one of the first sessions, when I was talking about some fundamental questions that, that thermodynamics will answer, was why would you get, if you look at the map of the power plants in the UK, for example, you see most of them on the, on, you know, near the sea. On the west coast, for example, in the north in Scotland or in Cumbria. And, or at least even if they're not by, by the uh, actual uh, sea, they are actually by a very large river or a pond or a lake. And I think that is, actually by now hopefully you see why you would need that because in here you have this indication of cooling water and you need a source for that cooling water in order to exchange heat um, in your condenser. And the, 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 the heat which comes from the hot reservoir would come from the, uh, the core of, of your power plant. So this engine is just a tool to allow you to convert the heat into something useful. And the thing useful here is this. This is the one which would generate energy, uh, so it would generate electricity for you. Now, I, I like to, so, I like to actually give you another example of the reversed heat engine, which is another very common cycle. This cycle, which in this, in this case actually the direction is this way, is in this anti-clockwise. You have very similar components in here, four comp comp uh, components, with small differences. Uh, for example, boiler is now uh, evaporator. Um, turbine, you don't have a turbine, you have um, a, a throttle valve. This is the engine which will be some, it, it will be used actually in, um, in that type of heat engine. Which means now the direction is from the cold reservoir to the hot reservoir. What is this? This is a refrigeration cycle or what we know as Carnot comes from the French name of Carnot, and then it, you know, it's just a very famous um, cycle. It's and um, it represents how refrigeration cycle cycles work. In this case, you've got the ice box, which represents the inside of the refrigeration, uh, the uh, the fridge, for example, or the freezer. In a refrigeration cycle, what you do, you extract heat. You, don't, you can't add cold, so you don't, that's not how you 
you would, you know, you would maintain the temperature. What you do, you extract the heat from from the food and whatever is actually in the container in in the ice box. And in this case, that actually represents your cold reservoir. It goes through the pump. That is where you would need the power. The reason why you would need to plug in your fridge, it's not only because of the light inside to see what things are, it's actually to, to operate that pump, which makes that noise uh, behind the, uh, the fridge. And that is a power which you would need in order to, to power the pump, and the pump would then push the, um, you know, the refrigeration fluid, which could be R12, for example, whatever that is. It then goes through the condenser. The condenser is those uh, is, is the, it is normally actually behind the fridge. You see lots of um, little pipes, pipe work behind. Um, that is the condenser, which would allow the heat to go out to, to the kitchen or to the room. And then that goes to the throttle valve, which in terms of the cycle, how, you know, PV diagram and things like that, throttle would act as a, as a, as a device which would, be, which would reduce the pressure and temperature of the fluid, just like what turbine does. Turbine exactly reduces the pressure and temperature as well, and in this case, throttle does the same thing. And if you have guessed, the hot reservoir in this example is actually a room, is the, the kitchen. It's large enough so that the, the, the heat that you're adding to the room is not actually going to change the temperature in the room. Sometimes it does if, if you're in a small room and the, the fridge is massive, you can actually feel that the room is, is, is getting hotter. But that in terms of the theory, um, you know, it's, it's large enough for the room um, to absorb the heat from the fridge and for its temperature not to change. Something that I've put in, in this diagram here, which is quite important, is not to confuse the word reversed with reversible. They mean different things. Reversed means that the direct heat engine is actually reversed. Reversible is talking about um, conservation of entropy and not change in entropy. Because if reversible means delta S is equal to zero. But reversed is referring to the cycle which is opposite to uh, the ranking cycle. And the last thing I want to mention is there's a, there's a very sort of short reference to heat pumps. I don't want to go through uh, the concept of heat pumps because you've, you've got, for example, air source heat, heat pumps and ground source heat pumps, which are quite interesting. I want you to go and read about them if, if you like. Um, there, is, there is a difference between, and I think this is the, this is, this is the part which talks about the difference between um, heat pump versus uh, refrigeration. And in order to emphasize what is the dif difference, I want you to go back to this uh, diagram again. So in both refrigerations and heat pumps, you have the same cycle. You have this type of reverse heat engine. The point is, in a refrigeration, you are interested in this. You are interested in Q2. It's the amount of heat that you're extracting. In heat pumps, you're interested in, in this, in Q1. It's the amount of heat which is adding um, to your um, hot reservoir. What do we use heat pumps for? Heat pumps are actually used in order to uh, heat up your, your house in winter, for example. And in winter, it would extract the heat from the outside. Um, and then it would actually heat up your, your house. And in that example, outside weather in winter would represent the cold uh, would represent the cold reservoir, and then your house would actually be the hot reservoir. And what the heat pump does, it transfers the heat from outside to inside. And you're not interested in this, you're interested in, in this. So it shows that by the same principle, you could have two different systems, two different devices, two different inventions, but based on the same concept and same heat engine and the same theory. So I've covered up to this point, and uh, we're going to go through that uh, hopefully next next on, on Thursday. 
I will also go through the uh, instructions for the, uh, for the quiz on Monday as well, and I will answer any questions um, about the quiz on Thursday. Okay?